Okay. So welcome back, guys. I'm sorry that we're meeting uh, online and remotely instead of in class. Uh, I don't even know at this point if you guys were able to take your board exams or not. If you did, I hope you guys all did well. If not, I'm sure that the board will be able to figure out when you guys can take that exam. Um, we're back together today again for the final uh, lecture of my three, um, discussing primary dentition, specifically um, trauma and space management. So I'm going to begin by talking about trauma. Um, basically, we're going to talk about uh, um, when a trauma enters into your chair, you want to get the whole story. You want to explore the problem. You want to find out your five W's and your H's, what we learned in fifth grade. You know, who, what, when, where, why, and how. Um, you want to make sure that you basically uh, insert yourself into what had happened at the time of the injury so that you have all the facts there so that you can do your due diligence to help the patient. You want to find out who was involved, what had happened, when, where, why, and then how. Um, the more details you know, the better you'll be able to help treat and address the trauma for the patient. Um, oftentimes when I'm working with my students, they'll come over and they'll say, hey, Dr. Tai, uh, this patient here, they're here for a recall. Um, everything looks great, no cavities or anything like that. Um, but he did crack his front tooth, he said, um, two years ago. Okay, well, how did he crack that tooth? I don't know, I didn't ask. You've been with your patient for 45 minutes and it didn't think or occur to you to ask how the injury occurred. So again, when you're talking to a colleague or just being able to write back into your notes, you need to know why, how, how did he crack the tooth um, so that you can document and reference it. When a trauma comes into your chair, you wanna be able to prioritize the medical status over the dental status. So after finding out the who, what, when, where, why, and hows, you're then gonna to start to kind of do an initial assessment to see are they stable uh, neurologically before you jump ahead and say, okay, well, we've gotta get this laceration sutured or whatever, we gotta get this filling done, we gotta um, make sure we start the root canal. Um, because if they're not stable neurologically and you start treatment, you're gonna compromise their systemic health. And then of course you wanna also explore, is this a baby tooth or is it a baby, uh, adult tooth? Because that's gonna also dictate how you're gonna go ahead with um, the type of treatment and how promptly you need to deliver that treatment. Um, so, like I said, the first thing you wanna do is assess neurologically. So, in medicine, they have a coma scale that's called Glasgow, and basically it determines the patient's neurological health and their uh, alertness and consciousness level. Uh, the Glasgow coma scale is up to 15. Uh, I would score 15 right now. Basically, it uh, takes into account eye movement, verbal, and uh, motor movement. Um, and the max score you can get in each category is five. Um, and so I would be a five in every category right now. Uh, three is considered comatose. Um, and anything below, uh, I think, 12 or 11. Uh, is considered uh, emergent, dangerous, and you need to prioritize neurological care first. Uh, I apologize, I don't remember the exact number right now, but then you'll see when you watch shows like Grey's Anatomy or Chicago Hope or whatever, uh, Coma Scale or GCS is 12, GCS is eight or whatever. They will spit that out all the time because that's how they're communicating with each other where the neurological status is. Um, so if they're at a 12 or 11, again, I don't remember the exact number, you need to get them out of your office and send them to the ER or call an ambulance for them. You also wanna determine what their uh, behavior and mental status is. Are they um, not exhibiting any pain when you would think this would be very painful? If so, maybe the adrenaline is still there, um, the pain hasn't registered, um, are they being violent, are they being calm? Because that's gonna kind of come into play with how you're going to deliver your care and what, and what method you'll deliver your care. care. Of course, you'll have to do a clinical exam, being very careful and mindful of the area that's been traumatized, and then a radiographic exam to supplement what your clinical findings are. So we're gonna go ahead now and discuss the different types of trauma. There are um, fractures, there are concussions, there's movement of natural tooth, of original tooth position, and then of course there's cuts. So if we do the fracture, we can take into account, is the tooth fractured, is the root fractured, is the bone fractured, or is there a combination of those that are fractured? 
Tooth fracture is very easy to see clinically. Root and bone fracture, you're gonna have to assess with the x-ray, which is why, again, based on my previous lecture, um, you guys know the importance of taking uh, dental x-rays. Um, concussion literally just means that the tooth got bonked. Um, the area usually presents with tenderness. Um, x-ray would determine the extent of how much it got bonked. Did it get bonked to the point where it moves into the third category where there's actually movement of where the tooth was originally placed? Um, subluxation means that there's movement of the tooth in its socket, but it hasn't actually been displaced. Usually it's um, concurrent with a little bleeding around the sulcus of the tooth. Um, extrusion means the tooth is lifted out of where it would normally be. Intrusion means it's gone in more than where it would be. And lateral luxation, it's moved to the side. And avulsion is completely, completely been extruded. That means the whole tooth is out of the mouth in the patient's hand in one piece. And believe it or not, that actually happens. Um, and then the final type of trauma would be a soft tissue or a cut um, on the lip, inside the cheek, tongue, any other soft tissue in the oral cavity. So this first x-ray here I have, um, patient came in with this injury um, from a fall, um, aided on the tile floor of his kitchen. And um, in the mouth, clinically, he presented with some mobility, for sure. And the x-ray shows that it's through and through fractures um, two-thirds of the way into the root, as you guys can see right here. So when something like this happens, you have to consider um, functionability, which there's not going to be much because the tooth is mobile and the area is probably painful and sensitive. And number two, systemic health. Is this a risk for aspiration? You bet it is. So treatment for this would be to extract. Now, once you go and extract the tooth, you're probably not going to be able to take the root tips with you because they've actually been severed and, and disconnected from the rest of the tooth. So do we go digging for the root pieces? The answer is no, because this is a primary tooth. And remember I said earlier, we have to differentiate between primary teeth versus permanent teeth and determine, and that helps us determine the course of action. So we don't go after primary tooth root fragments if they are left behind, because what ends up happening is if you keep shoving your instrument inward, you're going to jam and force that root reg, uh, remnant into the crown of the permanent tooth, thereby causing damage to it. The permanent tooth is not fully calcified yet at this point. And if you keep shoving it in, you can interrupt the calcification process. In doing so, you can cause um, dysplasia, um, I'm sorry, hypoplasia, where the calcium isn't settled very well and the tooth will present later with a yellow tan color on it. So the treatment here was to remove it and again leave those root tips. In this next trauma case here you see um, a full avulsion, uh, avulsion of tooth number E which is the upper right central primary incisor. Um, basically this child fell and when he fell he knocked out completely tooth number E with the adjacent tooth number F extruded. So remember I talked about earlier extremes the tooth is out from where it originally is um, and then there's a little bit of bleeding around the sulcus um, and in this case because it's a primary teeth we do not re-implant the tooth for the same reason as in my first example you shove that tooth back in yes the mom has the tooth in the mouth for the child he doesn't have a gap there but you just shoved it inwards and you may have interrupted the calcification process of tooth number eight that's still developing in the bone so no reimplantation of primary teeth ever. Um, let's say hypothetically, you've got a mom on the schoolyard, she sees this and she's just really well read. She had a <laughs> cup of milk with her. She sticks the tooth into milk to clean off any playground debris and then shoves it back into Johnny's tooth and then runs into the office and sees you. At that point, she tells you what everything happened. What are you gonna do? Are you gonna pull the tooth back out? No, we're not gonna take the tooth out. Mom already reimplanted the tooth, let it be. Um, but there are consequences that come with that. Mainly, like I said, damage to the permanent tooth bud, which you're gonna to explain to mom. Um, but you don't wanna do further damage by ripping it back out at this point. So you just explain to her the sequela of what could happen. One, the damage that we just discussed. Two, the tooth could become ankylosed. Ankylosis, you'll have to explain to parents, because remember, I talk about this all the time. I don't want you guys to talk in dental terminology. Parents are never gonna stop you and say, um, excuse me, what does ankylosis mean? Because they don't wanna look stupid in front of you. So you wanna be mindful and then you speak in general terms so they understand that basically the tooth was injured, the tooth popped out, you shoved it back in, it um, went through trauma. 
and the area basically kind of rubbed and kind of got scar tissue develop around it. So I use those kind of later terms. And what happens is when scar tissue develops around the area, the tooth, when it gets pushed back in, it glues itself around the area of that bone instead of just kind of sitting there loosely um, and able to fall out later. When that fusion occurs, when um, the patient turns seven or eight and the tooth was supposed to fall out and the adult tooth tries to push it down, it might not be able to fall out anymore because it got fused. So if that happens, then as he approaches eight, years old, I may have to come back and tell you, hey mom, this looks like the fusion did occur. We're gonna have to take the tooth out now so that the permanent tooth will erupt. Um, you also let t parents know that when you reimplant a traumatized tooth because it was basically ripped out of mouth, there was disruption to blood flow, there was disruption to the nerve, there could be damage to the nerve, that the tooth could start to discolor even though it's been reimplanted. And if it starts to discolor, look for a gray or blacking of the area. So again, just explaining the sequela to parents, but if they've already reinserted on their own, then you can't really do anything. You could take an x-ray just to kind of confirm the position, but you do need to do your due diligence to explain these risks to the parents from that reimplantation. This next trauma here is an intrusion. I have it um, shown in two different ways, two separate patients. Um, this one here, clinical photo shows that this lateral got shoved inwards um, due to a trauma. And then this x-ray shows that tooth number E was shoved inward. So um, sometimes when you see uh, a picture of it like this clinically, don't assume that the tooth was extruded unless the parent found the tooth or has the tooth in their hand. You take an x-ray to determine did the tooth go in or the tooth go out, okay? So here's a full intrusion. Now when something like this happens, what do you do? Do you have the doctor cut open the gums and then pull the tooth down, chain it all aggressively? No, in primary teeth, again, differentiating between primary and permanent, the chance for spontaneous eruption is extremely high. So you give a window of up to six months to allow spontaneous re-eruption, and you're gonna explain that to the parents. Now, if spontaneous eruption, re-eruption does not occur in a six month window, then yes, you're gonna to have to get an oral surgeon involved for them to evaluate the area. Ankylosis probably did happen under the, bone, uh, under the gum level and that tooth is not coming out. If the tooth is not coming out, that is going to later impact the eruption of the permanent successor. But what most oral surgeons will do is they'll probably leave it embedded in the gum line until closer to seven or eight when the permanent tooth would want to erupt before doing the surgery. And there's a couple of reasons for that, but the main one is that say the child's only three. To take it out now under general anesthesia, there's more risk the younger the child is. It doesn't change the outcome. Taking it out at three doesn't mean that tooth number eight comes out earlier. So there's no benefit to doing the surgery at three versus doing it closer to when the child is going to erupt perm the permanent tooth anyways. And now I say that the average eruption time, uh, spontaneous re-eruption time occurs within the first six months, but you know, the human body is so amazing and you guys have seen this. I mean, doctors will tell people, oh, they're in a coma, they're never coming out and families will hold on hope and then three years later they come out. So who's to say that at three, I, after six months, I don't see it re-erupt, but then all of a sudden at four and a half, I see a little bit of it peeking through. So there again is no indication for the oral surgeon to have to jump in that early, um, but just to prepare parents that if it's intruded and that does not spontaneously re-erupt at any point, that it's gonna to need to be assisted for removal at some point. And then my final picture here of another injury is um, soft tissue injury. So these are the best that it comes for me. Um, I, I don't like the root fractures, I don't like the intrusions, extrusions, evulsions, but soft tissue, I mean the um, mouth heals so well. Um, the saliva is very curative, um, it has a lot of healing properties. Um, you know, if you've ever bit your lip accidentally or been subject to getting punched in the face, get a fat lip, it heal. it looks awful the first 24 hours. Okay. But then all of a sudden after one night of sleep, you wake up the mor next morning, you're like, well, that didn't look as bad as I thought it was going to look. And I often hear that from parents where they will have fallen and hit the side of the bathtub at 7 PM, but not get into me until 10 AM the next morning and will tell me, um, over the phone, it's really, really, really bad. And then they come in the next morning at 10 and it's like, well, um, it's not as bad as it looked yesterday, but it really was bad yesterday. Um, you guys will notice when you get a paper cut, 
many of you guys probably do this without even thinking about it, but once you get a paper cut, the first thing you do is suck on your finger. And you do that very subconsciously because there are a lot of immunoglobulins in our saliva that help stop bleeding and that do have soothing effects. So lesions in the mouth, injuries like this in the mouth, I th um, do heal faster than if they were anywhere else in the body. They look bloody awful, but they do heal very well. Um, you do want to explain to parents that, you know, soft diet, keeping the area clean, warm salt water rinsing, um, and then certainly uh, gentle brushing the area to keep the area clean. Cut like A cut like this one would not even indicate sutures, and um, sutures are usually not indicated in the oral cavity, especially in the younger kids, because they're just not going to sit for it either. But if you're actually seeing something two, three inches deep, then a suture would be indicated. Um, usually at that point, though, they don't think to go to the dentist first. They probably would have checked themselves into the emergency room already. Um, let's talk about avulsed teeth. Um, first of all, you want to ask how it was brought in. Uh, sometimes parents will think to wash the tooth before they bring it in, but washing it is the worst thing that you can do to the tooth because water is not the same consistency as our saliva. And so there's the osmotic, uh, I'm sorry, uh, isotonic effect. They have to kind of exchange. And so you dry out and desiccate the tooth if you rinse it in water. So what you actually want to do is ideally put it in a cup of saliva. If you can just spit a lot of your spit or the child's spit into a cup and put it into saliva, that's the best medium. Um, second best medium would be milk. And if you happen to have it, they have these um, pre-packaged uh, solutions that are as close uh, electrolytically and pH wise to saliva. They're called save a tooth. Lots of baseball coaches will have it. Um, elementary school nurse, nurse offices will have it. A lot of dental offices might even have it. Um, but if it's brought into you, it's kind of almost that too late at that point to put it in um, because it may have already dried out. Um, but you'll be surprised. Lots of, like I said, sporting coaches and, and, and teams have this because they do know and have been trained that if a tooth falls out, you drop it in there right away. Um, another factor to consider is how long it's been out of the mouth. Um, the longer it's been out of the mouth, the poorer the prognosis. We're looking for 60 minutes. Anything longer than 60 minutes is not looking good at this point. Um, I talked earlier about primary teeth do not get reimplanted. Um, permanent teeth, you have a whole nother slew of questions that come into play. How old is the patient? That determines if the apex is open or closed. If the apex is open, a lot better prognosis than if it's closed. If it's closed, initiate, you have to initiate root canal right away. It's a lot more serious to try to save that tooth. Um, again, you still want to ask the question of how long it's been out of the mouth because that also plays into the prognosis of the um, avulsion, avulsed tooth. And then you'll have to do some type of splint. And usually we do a semi-rigid splint for up to 14 days to allow the tooth to kind of heal and kind of reattach itself into the socket. Um, I talked about some of these sequela before earlier. You want to make sure that you always explain these to parents. Again, in general terms, necrosis means the tooth just never reattaches. It can't get the blood supply and nerve supply it needs, and so it dies out. Um, which then leads to the last thing, ultimate loss of the tooth. And you do have to prepare parents for that, that, you know, I know it's a front tooth, we're gonna do the best we can to save it, but if we cannot, or it doesn't respond to treatment and therapies, the tooth may be lost, but there are so many advances now in dentistry, we can talk about implants, we can talk about uh, partials or dentures, or um, what they call a flipper. And just, it's a, a fake tooth on a retainer that the patient can wear until they're eligible for an implant, um, bridges, things like that. Uh, we talk about tooth discoloration. The main colors you'll see are graying or black. Pulpal obliteration just means that the nerve dies, and this can only be diagnosed on a dental x-ray. Usually pulpal obliteration is associated with some type of discoloration, but um, sometimes there's pulpal obliteration without any tooth color change. And then ankylosis, like I talked about earlier, was that fusion of the tooth to the bone. Um, whenever any trauma comes into your chair, you definitely want to do all the things I've talked about, finding out the big picture, addressing the trauma, treating the trauma. But in the back of your mind, I always want you guys to think, is there foul play? You need to rule out child abuse. The two always go together and you need to do due diligence, due diligence to make sure that child abuse has been ruled out. Um, because when we're working with the pediatric population, 
you want to be an advocate for them and you want to make sure that this the circumstances surrounding the trauma are legitimate and um and seem plausible so that's why you do your questions you get that full picture because does the story make sense to you um is this a repeat occurrence um build a little storyline documentation right kid comes in today injury during baseball practice two weeks later another injury during baseball practice six days later another injury during baseball practice maybe you've got a coach that's got a hot temper and he's beaten up on the kids or you know maybe the kids being beat by the parents and the, the cover story is baseball practice so um you kind of have to make sure you do proper documentation and then one of the other things that we can do as a clinician is to uh, pair up the clinical findings with the story we know that um a bruise has a timeline and so if the patient comes in and the parent says oh you know he slipped in I mean, he's just there for cleaning and you notice like a bruise on the forearm or something or on the cheek and the parents says oh you know he was being goofy last week he walked into the banister about a week ago and so he got a little bit of a bruise there well a week ago means the bruise should be kind of yellowish or brown but this bruise is purple so that's not making sense or the bruise is red so then you can ask a little bit more you can document you can find out what happened do you blow the whistle right away and call the child abuse hotline no because once you get an investigation open too that is very disruptive to the family and to the child and if you're wrong um, that could be very scarring as well but um, what you want to do is have the documentation because if there's any suspected abuse, you can bet your bottom dollar that someone at school is noticing it, a babysitter is noticing it, a neighbor's noticing it, a soccer coach is noticing it, you're noticing it, someone else is noticing it, that if at some point enough builds up and someone in that child's life um, calls Child Protection Services, you can bet that your charts are going to be subpoenaed and looked at as well. And if you have documentation in there that shows, oh, you know, dad reports patient, um, ran into the banister a week ago, bruise is on the face, two centimeters by three centimeters, color is brown, patient says area sensitive but isn't in any pain, then it just looks completely factual. It's not acu accusatory and, um, and they can use that. Um, so you want to make sure you document. Um, now, what are the goals of trauma management in the baby teeth? Um, you want to get the patient out of pain. Okay, again, pending, of course, that all neurological conditions are stable. Um, you want to preserve the oral health and the oral structures. You want to protect the adult teeth, you know, do everything you can. Um, and if you cannot or if you suspect damage to the adult teeth, make sure that you educate parents about it. Um, you want to restore or um, preserve the quality and function of the teeth to maximize the quality of life for the patient. And you want to use that as an opportunity to educate, okay? So he fell off his scooter, landed on top of, um, uh, landed on top of the cement, rolled over, hit the handlebars, knocked out his front tooth, um, and then has a big gash on his forehead too. And in talking to the parents for the who, what, when, where, how, and why, you found out he wasn't even wearing a helmet. Now, granted, he was fortunate there was no head injury, but use that as an opportunity to educate the patient and let them know that you need to be wearing a helmet. First of all, it's a law if you're under 18. Second of all, I mean, you could have done more damage. Um, and anticipatory guidance just basically means explaining to parents what to expect for that age group. So for example, anticipatory guidance that's appropriate for a 12 to 18 month old would be, hey mom, he's starting to learn to walk now, make sure there's no sharp corners in the house, you know, make sure that um, doors are left open, um, that the, he doesn't stick his fingers in the hinges in the area where doors can close on him. Um, proper, to, proper anticipatory guidance for a four, four or five or six year old would be, hey, they're gonna start learning to ride a bike now, make sure that you're always wearing a helmet, whenever he's in the car, make sure he's in the car seat, the seat belt has to be on. So there's different things that you can educate at different milestones and ages that can help prevent trauma and injury, okay? So sometimes um, when we have an injured tooth or we lose a tooth, we have to talk about space management, which means um, maintaining the area of the tooth that's lost early. First and foremost, you need to know the eruption pattern. Um, I don't expect you guys to memorize this. Obviously, you're not gonna be working with baby teeth as much, 
But there's a little bit of something called a rule of three that can help you guys. And I use this to help parents as well. The rule of three is that most kids will get all of their baby teeth by the time they're three. And most kids will get all their adult teeth by the time they're 13. So that's the number three there. Um, and knowing these timelines gives you a rough idea to educate parents on when the new tooth would come in. So like I said, the front upper anterior teeth, tooth number E and F right here, are expected to be lost around six or seven, but yet their permanent successors don't come in until seven or eight, which is why so many times you see kids around seven or six or seven years old with the two front teeth missing with a nice window there because the teeth aren't coming. And I get asked so often, these teeth fell out four months ago and I don't see the adult teeth at all. Where are they? Um, well, they are gonna take up to another year before they fall out. And that's very shocking for a lot of parents because then the reason why they're asking is because they think something's wrong and something's preventing the blocking of the teeth. Now, what's funny or interesting is that the lower front teeth are lost around the age of six or seven, but they grow back at six or seven as well. And so you'll see parents ask that. When the bottom two fell out, I saw the new ones right away, but how come these fell out and I don't see the adult ones anywhere? It actually happens like that naturally. So this is the way the, the eruption process works. Um, there are different types of space maintainers that we use in dentistry, and I just want you to be aware of them because you may see them in a child's mouth. Um, your practice may or may not provide them, uh, depending on if you work for a pediatric dentist or not. Um, the three types that I'll talk about are the band and loop and the distal shoe, which are both considered unilateral, which means they're only on one side of the mouth. And then the third one is the bilateral, um, which is uh, for either the upper or lower arch. I have the word permanent teeth there because bilateral um, space maintainers must be abutted on permanent teeth. So if you don't have permanent teeth, you can't use a bilateral spacer. So that's what that means. Let's break it down and show you guys what I mean, okay? So abandoned loop. Let's say for example, you have three teeth in the lower right arch. So here's your three teeth, okay? This is tooth number S, which is the primary first molar. This is tooth number T, which is the primary second molar, and this is tooth number 30, which is the permanent first molar. The child is seven. Tooth number T is completely bombed out and needs to be extracted. Tooth number T, according to your eruption sequence uh, timetable, isn't supposed to shed until about 11 to 13 years old. But he's only seven, and we're gonna take that one away, so bye-bye. So now I've extracted tooth number T. What's gonna happen over time is the area is gonna heal nicely and everything like that, but teeth exist to always be in contact. They love to be interactive. So a tooth needs to feel a neighbor on its side and a tooth needs to feel a neighbor on its head, okay? So what's gonna happen is with this tooth gone for five more years, potentially, this tooth here is gonna to start to slide over and this tooth's gonna to slide over and they're gonna close their space like that. And now they're locked in together like that. When he does turn 12, this guy cannot come in. Uh, I'm stuck. I can't grow in. So now your permanent premolar is blocked out of the arch. So abandoned loop will keep these two upright. You put a ring around one tooth and then you extend an arm forward to keep these two upright so that they don't fall onto each other. Now the issue I talked about how teeth have to always be in contact with each other on the sides and also on the top. What happens is the tooth on the top here could potentially supra erupt, meaning it will keep going and going out until it reaches something like this. You don't see that happen a lot in baby teeth because the supra eruption process takes a long time to do, but sometimes you'll see it a lot with older patients, and I don't know if you've seen it already with some of your patients now, who maybe never had enough money to do a bridge or a partial or a denture, and then tooth number, um, tooth number 19 is gone, and tooth number 14 is completely completely out touching onto the alveolar ridge. And so you'll see that happen, okay? Um, here is a photo of that band and loop I was talking about. So this is literally tooth number S, tooth number T that was extracted and tooth number 30 um, that we had to basically band and put an arm forward and basically go stop, don't move forward anymore, no one tilt around and stay that way. Now, if you were to remove tooth S, you have tooth number T intact still. You can do the same thing by banding tooth number T, putting the R forward and leaning against tooth R to preserve the space of tooth number S. What becomes a problem, and here's the x-ray here that shows, okay, what, I'm sorry, no, that's not the x-ray. 
What becomes a problem is if the tooth that you need to remove prematurely is last in the arch. So in this x-ray, and I apologize, it's a little dark to see, this tooth here, tooth number T, is completely bombed out. It has a failed pulpotomy on it, but tooth number 13 has not erupted yet. This child is probably five years old. Um, so you can't put a band in loop anymore. What you do is you call, you put something called a distal shoe. So that's what this looks like here. What a distal shoe does is it wraps itself around this tooth. It sends an arm back and it drops a metal bar down. So the metal bar goes down under the gum line. It is best to do a distal shoe on the same day that you extract the tooth because the socket is open already. So you can stick that peg right down. If you don't do the distal shoe or place the distal shoe on the same day as the um, procedure of the extraction, then you're going to have to renumb the area, use a scalpel to cut, and then try to measure and find out where it goes. Now, the two cases here are not identical. This one has a root canal treated tooth on it. This one does not. I'm just kind of showing what a distal shoe looks like because I didn't have one matching pair. Um, so you guys understand the concept. But once this bar is dropped down, what it does is it guides this guy to come up and lean against it, just like how vines, when they grow, they just grow up against the wall. So this tooth here, the premolar, underneath tooth number T, does not erupt until 12 or 13 years old. But tooth number 30 is a, primary, is a permanent first molar, which erupts around the age of six or seven. So he's going to come up before this one does. So number 30 will erupt before 29. And if you do not have this distal shoe, number 30 is going to erupt completely measly. It's going to tilt itself, and it's just going to go into the arch this way, thereby still blocking number 29 when it's time for 29 to grow in. Okay? So that's the concept for that. Distal shoes are very difficult to do. Normally when I place a distal shoe, I place it, I take a picture before I cement it, and then I cement it. The reason why I do that is because distal shoes can go wrong. So these are cases where distal shoes have gone wrong, where it does more harm than help. Um, in this situation, the distal shoe peg was placed too far distally and basically is now sitting on top of the crown of the tooth, preventing the tooth from erupting. Now, what's gonna happen is tooth number 19 in this photo could have also been damaged because of where the peg is. If it went and dug in deep enough when it was still um, not fully calcified, it can cause a hypoplastic area on that tooth. And now you can also see that it's still mesially drifting. So it's imparting in this way here. This second picture shows that it's completely shoved down. So number 19 was able to erupt, but now you may have damaged tooth number 20 and its calcification process. So if you do see something like this, you do bring it to your doctor's attention, the spacer would need to be removed. Um, the benefit in terms of saving the adult tooth over the mesial shift, um, because that in this case can be addressed with ortho. If the shift is too severe, then it's a lot more extensive for orthodontists. Here is a model of abandoned loop that was done. Uh, this is incorrect. Uh, when you have two teeth missing back to back like this and you do a band and loop this long, this is likely to break and fracture because the arm on that cannot withstand all the chewing and mastication forces. So when you have two teeth missing on one side or you have one tooth on this side and one tooth on this side that needs to be extracted, you move into what is called a bilateral space maintainer. And on the upper arch, that's called a nance or a transpalatal arch wire, and on the bottom it's called a lower lingual holding arch. Now this is um, a, show, a photo of sh that is incorrect, uh, what not to do. I talked about earlier where bilaterals have to be placed on permanent teeth. Um, this is a nance, and basically it's bounded on the permanent second, uh, primary second molar on both sides, and it has a little rooftop button to basically hold back the tooth. So you're looking at this and you're thinking, well, how is that going to keep these two teeth from drifting measly? Um, you guys have to think about the old laws of physics. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, okay? You have to vision, envision that this retainer is not flat like this, but basically it's got two bands here and then it's got an arch going up like this to the button. So it's now actually a triangle. And so what's happening is for the pressure that's being pushed up into the roof of the mouth, it's holding back those two teeth this way. So the vectors are going this way and that way, okay? Um, 
This child had to lose tooth A, B, I, and J. That's a lot of teeth to lose. And so it was fabricated anyways against primary tooth. I think in some situations like this, it is practical clinically. Um, in theory, we are recommended not to bond on primary teeth only because after 12 or 13 years old, these are going to exfoliate too, but these will have erupted by then. You have two options for this. One, you cannot place the spacer this young because they are a little uncomfortable to wear and inform parents a space loss will occur if you don't put a retainer. We're gonna wait till he turns six to seven. As soon as we see number three and 14 fully erupted, bam, we're gonna get that upper arch in. Um, this here on the bottom, this patient lost tooth K, L, S, and T, but they had the permanent teeth already, so it was bounded and bonded to those, and then it's leaning against. This is the lower arch. This is called a lower lingual holding arch. And again, it's doing equal and opposite reactions. So here, everything's on the same plane. You've got two rings here, and then you're uh, leaning against the lower permanent incisors. So for every push this way, you're gonna push back this way, so then the permanent first molars cannot drift forward anymore. So that's how it's holding back the space, okay? So um, a few thoughts on goal of space management is that you want to prevent the loss of space. Um, space maintainers do not gain space. So if, let's say, they were at another dentist, they had a tooth taken out, they lost insurance, they didn't come back for another year, and then you decide or your dentist decides that a spacer is needed, it's not going to regain space, but it will hold the space that you still have, which is going to be very helpful for any orthodontist. So any space that you need, to, I mean, that you have, you want to hold. Space maintenance, you also want to make sure parents understand, does not rule out the need for future orthodontics. Oftentimes, I'll explain to them, okay, we're taking this one out here, we'll put this retainer here to prevent space loss so that this one can grow in correctly. That doesn't mean it's not going to grow in crooked, so that doesn't mean that future orthodontics is not still going to be needed, okay? So you want to make sure you're very clear with your parents on that as well. Um, this is my last lecture with you guys. I talked to you guys about this before, but um, it's something very important and dear to me and Professor Chung. So I want to just reiterate this with you guys, um, that when you are dealing with the pediatric patient population, they are pediatric. Okay, the government sets the number at 18. So 18 it is, guys. Um, no matter what, we are a health professional service. We, um, I know that dental offices are still uh, businesses and many times a lot is driven by profit, um, loss, and, loss and profit, but we are a professional service. We're in healthcare, so you need to maintain that. High standards, high ethics, okay? Um, and to do what is right because we we all made a pledge to enter healthcare and do and do this So to all of our counterparts out there that are working in the hospital in the front lines I mean if they decided that they didn't want to put themselves at risk for coronavirus and decided to just call it sick They basically abandoned their pledge to being in healthcare So you have to remember your ethics your professionalism and your your responsibility because you chose to do healthcare and you said you wanted to help others um, the second thing is consent, consent, consent. I've talked about this before. Your sister's, your kid is a nephew of yours. He's 15. You need to do your sealants to graduate. You're just going to bring him in, sit him in the chair and place sealants on him. There's no written consent. Ah, uh, you tell Professor Chung, it's fine. It's my nephew. It's going to be fine. He's my nephew. He's still your nephew. You're not his legal guardian. And what if your sister and his, your nephew's parents are divorced? or not married and your and his father was not okay with you doing sealants. You don't want or need any of that coming back to you, okay? Um, every state has different um, laws uh, in the state of California and in the state of New York, I believe once a female becomes pregnant and has a child, she is considered an adult, so she can give consent. Um, so there are unique laws in each state. Um, there are, uh, codes here. I left it here that basically children under the age of 15, uh, children age 15 and older can actually consent to their own medical care if they meet all three of these criteria. Um, so many times they don't meet criteria number three. Um, so again, keeping in mind the state laws and making sure you get proper consent. Okay. Um, I think I talked to you guys about these last lecture. Um, 
just some child abuse cases in the news media recently that I just want to share about how crazy it is out there, how important it is to be a pediatric um, advocate. I love my profession. I love my specialty specifically. You'll hear me say that all the time. We um, have talked about the first two already. Um, this one is a reminder, the mom wanted to go buy off of Craigslist the portable plastic blue swimming pool tubs. And she went and she drove it over to the house to pick it up with her sedan with her nine-year-old son and realized, wait a minute, I can't transport this back home. So I'm going to throw it on the roof of my car and have my nine-year-old son sit inside that pool while I drive it home. Um, so she certainly was called, um, police were called, and I don't remember what her jail time was, but she definitely was charged with child abuse and endangered men. This second case we did not talk about yet. It's a very tragic case. It happened um, two years ago, two and a half years ago. Um, a father in Arizona, a 30-year-old father um, and mother, they worked um, opposite shifts so they could be home with the baby. So mom was on her way out to work when dad was coming in. Um, you know, he's tired from a graveyard shift. We get it. Um, baby wouldn't stop crying. Um, so he left him in the swing for a while, still wouldn't stop crying. So he tried to get the baby to stop crying. And the method that he employed was to lay the child on the couch, bend his legs up this way. So his feet are at his ears now and then lay across him like that. Um, so basically he folded his child in half. He was rushed to the emergency room. He sustained rib fracture, liver puncture. Um, he did not make it, of course, unfortunately. Um, that father is in jail. Um, very, very sad. Um, and the last case we did talk about also where the 46 year old mom took a uh, bow saw, which is that saw the hand saw with the serration on the end to her 11 year old autistic son's throat just because i forgot what it was i think he was she was yelling at him for not doing homework but he actually was doing homework he was able to wrestle her wrestle him off wrestle her off of him um but my point to all this is children do not ask to be born um those of us that are in healthcare, and then those who specifically dedicate ourselves to young children, teachers, pediatricians, pediatric dentists, speech pathologists, anything that relates to pediatrics, we have to be advocates for them. Um, don't blow the whistle if you're not sure, but the best you can do where we're at in, in oral health care is please document, 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 and do report if you do believe in any suspected cases of child abuse or endangerment. Okay, guys? Um, so again, I'm really sad that we couldn't do this in person um, this time. I really enjoy coming out to you guys and speaking to you guys. Um, I hope that you're able to finish off your last semester well and strong. I wish you all the best in your careers um, and to stay safe, healthy, happy, and well. Um, that's it. Um, if you need to reach me, Dr. Uh, Professor Chung has my contact information, um, and I'll bring it up on my first slide again here if you guys need to um, reach me. I think it's on here. Let me double check. Sorry. Uh, that's my contact office number there. Okay, but if you need my email address, Professor Chung can get that to you guys. Thank you guys. Be safe, be well. Bye.